So uh, thank you very much to Michelle and to Lucilla and to everyone who's here for the uh, opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our our project, uh, which was part of the original uh, uh, DBPs, um, and as was mentioned, is sort of is winding down, and we do have some uh, results to share and and some important products that actually uh, Dr. Bethany Michael has been really spearheading uh, that uh, should be able to be used in lots of future uh, outcomes-oriented research projects. So uh, it really was quite a distributed team. So we had uh, folks from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Leahy Health in Boston, and from the Veterans Affairs Mid-South uh, Healthcare Network led by Michael, um, and tremendous efforts by the whole group there, um, as, and as well uh, from UCSD with Grace and the team uh, here, and I, I just wanted to point out that, um, and this is, I'm, I'm not, honestly, I'm not trying to say this in a modest way, this team over the course of the last week worked so incredibly hard in trying to pull together the results that will show you the preliminary results, uh, which was a really, uh, as I think Michael pointed out, a Herculean effort on the part of a bunch of folks, uh, both on the coding and, uh, uh, and data validation side, as well as sort of the methodologic and even slide presentation slide. And so thank you to everyone who's been contributing. Uh, it is a, a lot harder to do distributed analysis than you might think. Um, so what we were gonna go over today was a little bit about, about the background of what this project was. Um, the review of the methods, a uh, initial review of the results. So these are the preliminary final results, so they're no longer interim results, so they're the final results, but they're preliminary because we have to uh, have uh, further exploration of some gaps in the data mapping that has occurred. And then finally, the conclusions. So the background of this project. So um, in terms of medication surveillance, uh, the FDA has uh, typically been the sort of uh, principal stakeholder in monitoring the safety of medications and medical devices and biologics after uh, their release into clinical practice. Um, and the FDA has employed a combination of mandatory but primarily voluntary adverse event reporting um, vehicles. And these suffer from significant limitations, the biggest of which is that there's really no denominator information. That is, there's no uh, knowledge by the FDA about exactly how many uh, doses of a particular medication are used or how many patients got a particular device. There's uh, significant incomplete reporting of these adverse events. It falls upon the providers and the in healthcare institutions to submit them. It's thought that less than 0.5 percent of significant adverse events are reported and there is clearly uh, evidence for reporting bias um, within those reports. Um, some dramatic examples from the last 10 years include uh, the notable uh, medication failures of Vioxx, uh, Tequin, and rosiglitazone, uh, all of which uh, in the post-market phase were determined to have significant um, and life-threatening cardiovascular complications or um, um, endocrine complications. So, in response to this recognized limitation of medication surveillance in the U.S. Uh, that has relied so much on voluntary or spontaneous reporting, there's been uh, several initiatives to look at more active surveillance uh, paradigms. Uh, these have uh, been undertaken to review and aggregate administrative databases that really have very little uh, cl clinical data embedded in them. Um, but are of su uh, su sufficient scale that uh, often s even small trends and outcomes between patient populations can be deter determined. Uh, clinical registries, which are often very specific to a particular disease state, and now uh, electronic health records, which are becoming so much uh, more available for use for uh, this type of health outcomes research. In 2007, the Sentinel Initiative uh, was a large uh, FDA uh, effort that was launched to connect uh, enhanced claims data um, owners uh, to support timely sort of uh, uh, queries of particular questions of particular medication outcome associations. But we're going to focus today on sort of what is at the vanguard of outcomes surveillance, which is using electronic health records. Um, 
And the value of this exercise is really in trying to capture and account for the depth of clinical information that's really only available through electronic health records as opposed to what's available more generally in administrative claims data. So in order to explore the use of distributed uh, surveillance of electronic health records, we uh, proposed an exploration of two new or relatively new uh, medications. They're both uh, oral hematologic medications, and we were going to compare them to the traditional medications. So we were comparing Dibigatran, which brand name is Pradaxa, versus Warfarin, brand name Coumadin. Um, and the second comparison was Prasugrel, or Effient, compared to Clopidogrel, or Plavix. And to do this, we um, developed three use cases. The first was atrial fibrillation, where we were looking at dibigatran versus warfarin. The second was venous thromboembolic disease, where we're also looking at dibigatran versus warfarin. And the last is acute coronary syndrome, where a patient was treated with a, with a particular type of stent, which is very common in the United States to use for this condition, and that was looking at prasugrel and comparing it to clopidogrel. Um, so just a little bit about these medications and why we're interested in looking at them. Well, for almost any therapeutic uh, product, um, and specific uh, to our product, these are oral uh, hematologic medications, we're looking at both safety and efficacy. And so the project was proposed to explore the safety by monitoring the safety, looking at common bleeding complications, as well as rare life-threatening um, hemorrhagic complications like hemorrhagic stroke or TTP. Uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Um, we also were monitoring the efficacy or how well these new drugs um, treated the condition for which they were being prescribed, and that was a reduction or prevention of embolic stroke, a prevention of repeat thromboembolic disease, a prevention of recurrent cardiac procedures, or prevention of death. So uh, just real quick, uh, the medication, so warfarin, Coumadin, this was approved back in 1954. So this is a durable medication. It's been used for decades. It in interferes with our uh, metabolic production of procoagulant proteins. Um, now, the problems are that it has a very narrow th therapeutic range, which means that in an individual patient, it's quite easy to uh, have too much Coumadin on board that leads to over-anticoagulation or too little, and it's highly variable patient to patient. So there's a monitoring that's required, which is a blood test that's done with a frequency of sort of two to four weeks in, uh, in frequency. Um, there's a high rate of serious adverse events if one is either over anticoagulated or under anticoagulated. And it's been demonstrated that there's significant genetic variability. So part of the variation between patients is their own genetic predisposition to be sensitive or not so sensitive to this vitamin K antagonist. Now, dibigatran is a medication that works in a different way. It's really a direct thrombin inhibitor. Uh, it was approved only in 2010, so at the time that this I-DB2-DBP2 was launched, it was very new. Um, there's no monitoring required, partially because there's no known genetic variability in the response to this medication. Uh, it had been shown, uh, as I'll show you in a second, that at the doses used commonly in the United States, there's a reduced rate of thromboembolic events. The problems with it are compliance. Uh, it's a twice daily medication, and we know that the more often a patient needs to take a medication, the more likely it is that they will forget to take a medication. Um, and so it was shown, even in the setting of a randomized trial, to have a lower compliance rate than with standard once-a-day Coumadin. Uh, there was also associated with it, as one sort of expects, as you tilt the sort of uh, clotting cascade in one direction or another, if you're going to prevent more clotting complications, you're probably going to lead to more bleeding complication. And that was seen in the major trial, and that's shown here. This is the RELY trial. Um, which is, uh, was published back in 2009 and uh, shown, I think uh, we can see up on the, on the big display, warfarin is the top line. This is the time uh, in months from um, zero, time zero. Let's see if I can, how do you press the button? There it is. Uh, 
So uh, time zero out to 30 months. So uh, this is the actual event rate, really, really low, less than 5%. But if we blow it up and change the vertical axis, in gray is shown uh, the accumulating event rates for, this is recurrent, uh, I'm sorry, this is risk of first stroke or systemic thromboembolism for patients who have atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm, commonly associated about a 2% annual risk of, in an otherwise uncomplicated patient of the risk of stroke. And here's a low dose dabigatran, which is not what we use in the United States, but here's the high dose dabigatran. And it's this difference, which is the advantage that dabigatran was thought to offer, as well as the advantage that it doesn't require monitoring. The other um, comparison we're doing is between clopidogrel, Plavix, of which there had been a flurry of advertising in the latter part of the last decade, uh, Plavix, which approved in 1997. It's a platelet inhibitor as opposed to a uh, anticoagulant. It has some problems. It, it has a modest effect. It's slow um, and it has a delayed onset of action. It requires a conversion from a prodrug. There's a lot of interpatient variability. There are genetic uh, variability in efficacy. Um, and um, it too uh, has uh, been the subject of lots of exploration for sort of better drugs. And the drug that uh, came out first that was a direct competitor to Plavix is the medication Prasugrel, which is also the same class of medication, a thionopyridine. And we'll look at the trial data in a moment, but it shows, uh, again, improved cardiac out outcomes. And again, this sort of, if you improve the platelet inhibition, you're probably going to improve the cardiac uh, event rates by preventing more cardiac event rates at the expense of causing more bleeding. And this is seen over and over and over in these hematologic medication trials. So there's going to be a concern for increased bleeding. Um, rapid onset of action, no known genetic uh, variabilities, uh, but again, the higher, higher rate of bleeding specifically in certain patient populations. And this is the data kind of similar to what we just saw with the RELY trial for dabigatran. Uh, this was published uh, in 2007, and this shows the advantage uh, in, in this case, the advantage of Prasugrel having a lower subsequent cardiac event rate. Uh, but a slightly higher bleeding rate. Both of these turn out to be statistically significant. There's about a 20% reduction in, um, in repeat heart attacks or repeat cardiac procedures. Uh, really a very, very small difference, but a, a difference in the risk of death, especially in patients who are suffering major heart attacks. But a statistically significant, though slight increased risk of, um, of bleeding, of major bleeding. All right, so we've hopefully set the stage. And by the way, I know this is immediately post-lunch, so, and it's a long presentation, so if you have to get up and jump around or anything, or you need to ask questions, please do so, because we don't want, <laughs> we don't want the whole audience to sort of fade away on us if, you know, during, during this presentation. Um, so how did we get the data? And again, I, I guess to set this up, we have clinical trial data that leads to FDA approval of a medication. The trial data is really uh, obtained by studying a highly select population of patients. Uh, these were relatively large trials, uh, 6,000 patients and 3,000 patients. Those are relatively large drug trials for very common conditions, but the conditions are so common that when these medications are approved, they're used by millions of patients, and in many cases, patients who would never have been included in the trials to begin with. So our challenge is to uh, try to assess the on, sort of assess the safety in the real world of medications in a way that has been very challenging for most countries, but certainly in the United States where we do not have uh, rigorous and mandated registries of such patients. So the steps of our sort of the methodological approach I'm going to outline, and then Michael Metheny is going to go over in much greater detail the specifics. So we had to get the data, and the proposal was we're going to look at three different healthcare institutions, um, which I'll explain in a minute. We're going to extract the data uh, in a very detailed and granular way from the electronic health record. From the data that we extract, we have to find those cases. Again, uh, in order to <coughs> compare relevant patient groups, we want to look at patients who are similar to one another between the different centers that have are, are, are somehow representative as best as we can uh, hope uh, to the understanding the safety of a medication in an average patient. And so we're going to select unique records from the EHR at each center. Uh, 
uh, based on a diagnosis as well as some features about the patient in terms of whether they've had a medication before, whether they've had the medication and it's been stopped, that would potentially bias the results in a significant way. Uh, and then one of the most challenging processes is even if you understand in detail how the data is represented at your local electronic health record, at your local institution, we have to be able to share those across institutions and we map to a common data model and we implement it against the OMOP standard, which Michael will talk about in more detail. Um, a major accomplishment, I think, of this, uh, of, of this project has been the development of the OCEANS toolkit, which is basically a suite of statistical applications that's open source available through the iDash website that allows for comparative analysis of, uh, of many different data structures but specifically has um, terrific uh, connectivity to the OMOP data structure. And, uh, and then we're going to show you how we, how we did it uh, and what the preliminary results show. So what was the study setting? Well, there were really um, multiple sites. Actually, is that Michael, I'm sorry, is it actually nine sites of the VA instead of four? Six. I was close. Okay. This was a, you got to realize this, this whole presentation is really sort of a dynamic and just-in-time presentation where we're editing it as of, you know, midnight last night again this morning. So my apologies to the VA where there's two, two other sites. So we can sort of inflate the VA column here by a little bit because this is based on four sites of the VA. UCSD uh, had a bed total of 535 beds. You can see almost 600,000 uh, outpatient visits, 23,000 admissions. The VA, uh, the subset that I had analyzed here, uh, cumulative uh, number of beds, 827 beds, 1.8 million outpatient visits, uh, but fewer admissions. And that is uh, actually uh, something that's going to be very interesting and a, and a, and a common uh, refrain during the course of our results is that these institutions are very different. The VA really has longitudinal and outpatient care that's uh, consistently used by the patients who use that health system. They also have sicker patients that need more visits on the outpatient side. And then we had two um, institutions within Partners Healthcare System, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Mass General Hospital. They're both sizable hospitals uh, with over 1,600 beds combined, with over 45,000 admissions a year, but again, much more modest outpatient volume relative to admissions uh, as compared to the VA. So we're just going to uh, take those out and combine those into Partners Healthcare, and that's how I'll be uh, presenting the results uh, is in this aggregate partners healthcare sort of representing the Boston uh, Academic Medical Center uh, group. And it's those uh, three organizations, so it's going to be UCSD, the VA, and partners healthcare that we'll continuously kind of refer back to as the participating sites. All right, how did we, uh, how did we get the cases? Well, the goal was to identify representative and somewhat similar patients at the participating hospitals. Uh, but as I've already mentioned, the VA system really has exceptional longitudinal care with an integrated EHR, as well as comprehensive medication dispensing information. Um, and that's quite different than the academic medical centers that is UCSD, Mass General, and Brigham, where there's really heterogeneous use of the longitudinal care within the system. So patients may come to the hospital from private or uh, unaffiliated uh, clinical practices where the information around their outpatient experience is not captured in the uh, academic medical center's uh, EHR. There's also uh, very limited drug dispensing information. In fact, it's really non-existent at those academic centers. Uh, but interestingly, uh, there's accelerated adoption of new medications at those centers as compared to the VA for reasons that we can uh, think about together at the end of the, uh, our, our, our discussion. So there is a whole method to the madness of how to find patients at these different centers that were, we believed uh, would be similar enough to one another that we could uh, reliably compare them. So the first thing was identifying a primary diagnosis. Does the patient have atrial fibrillation? And then probably uh, the most unique thing that we did uh, was we tried to tease out those patients in whom we thought there was a high likelihood that we would capture subsequent events. And we call this connectedness. And there is some um, uh, similar uh, efforts uh, in the medical literature, uh, but it's a highly variable how uh, different investigators, what parameters different investigators use. So we used a definition of connectedness that said, we only want to look at patients who had some relationship to that healthcare system sometime before this index admission with the thought that they would be more likely, therefore, to have some connection to this healthcare system after the event. Uh, 
um, and by restricting it to patients who had some sort of primary care or cardiology encounter, these were all cardiac admissions, uh, that they had to occur some time between one month and two years prior to the first presentation of this new condition, that they had to be related or connected to that healthcare system earlier. Uh, we excluded patients who were in palliative care. We removed patients who had the same diagnosis sometime in the several years prior. We removed patients who were on one of the four drugs, uh, thinking that if they were switched from one drug to a different drug, that that might indicate that there was a reason why they switched, meaning they weren't tolerating the first drug, so we wanted to have patients who had not been previously exposed to the medications. We also uh, decided to drop patients with a length of stay greater than 30 days because none of these conditions should a priori lead to that length of stay, and we thought that could would sort of uh, potentially confound our outcomes analysis. Um, we certainly got, we, we, we also <laughs> got rid of those patients who were on the other study drug so that uh, we weren't studying patients who were on two study drugs at the same time. And we retained um, only those patients who stayed on the study drug for 30 days or more. And finally, we censored all the events really in the first 30 days, and we were looking at the chronic effects, uh, thinking that there was a lot of noise in the first 30 days related to that index hospitalization. So uh, a lot of steps to go through, and of course you lose a lot of patients along the way, but the hope is that the cohorts you end up with at the end are those that, from which you can distill some useful uh, information in comparing them amongst the groups. So this is what we start with when we look across the institution. And uh, again, each here it is, uh, our three uh, use cases. So that's atrial fibrillation, venous thromboembolism, and acute coronary syndrome with drug-eluting stents. And you can see that we start out with around 6,800 patients in the VA, 6,800 patients in UCSD, 16,000 patients uh, in Partners Healthcare. And atrial fibrillation is definitely the most common of all of the conditions, uh, followed by venous thromboembolic disease. And this is a far less common, um, uh, co less frequently identified patient cohort, uh, although it's actually the patients that I take care of almost exclusively. Um, so we go through all the steps, getting rid of those patients. You could see the one of the big drops um, is uh, going to be the, uh, well, I think the connectedness, uh, we lose a lot of patients early for connectedness. And then our final tallies are down here, so we get around uh, 1,200 patients in the atrial fibrillation cohort, 1,500 patients in the, par uh, I'm sorry, oh, that's the combination, we don't have the totals here, so I'll show you the totals in a moment. But these are the residual um, case finding for each of the cohorts. And we have, we believe, um, sort of a, a coding or mapping error within UCSD under ACS. So we're not going to include uh, those patients in our analysis, which uh, probably will not significantly, uh, you know, change the analysis, but we'll go back and check that mapping uh, before final results are released. All right. So I think, Michael, I think is this your turn, your cue? I believe it is. Okay. So Michael's going to speak to data collection and the methods. So thank you. So um, instead of uh, doing my presentation following uh, Fred um, and doing a, dem a live demo of Oceans, we thought it, it's probably most appropriate to embed the discussion of the common data model and the uh, analytic system within this talk because this is the best example of an actual use of these uh, distributed analytic tools. So let me make sure that I can, there we go. And, and as, Fred, uh, as Fre Fred mentioned, um, you know, trying to do this across three disparate health systems, each with their own uh, electronic health record data mapped to different standard terminologies, in some cases not mapped to standard terminologies, and to be able to execute a, an analytic plan across all of those institutions really requires a lot of uh, careful data transformation, data validation, and, and work up front before you even get to the analysis stage. And so, um, you know, the, in, in the last five years, there's been a big uptake in, well, maybe 10, but, um, but certainly in the last five years, there's been an inflection point in the interest in the use of common data models and in standardized terminologies in order to try to um, map multiple disparate health systems into a, a common pool of analyzable data. 
And um, we evaluated during the first year of the DBP, there was a large team, uh, Daniela Meeker, uh, Lolo Ginimi, a number of other folks from UCSD and, uh, and, uh, and other institutions that evaluated what, uh, what common data models might be most appropriate for us to use for this DBP. And it turns out that um, OMOP was the, uh, was the one that was selected, the other candidates, I2B2, and there are some other um, potential candidate models particularly because it was developed uh, specifically for the use case of comparative effectiveness research for medication work. And it was a partnership between uh, government, industry, and academia. It started in 2008 and evolving over a period of years up until, uh, up, up until now. Actually, it went through four significant uh, version iterations. Um, and one of the challenges we faced as we were drug along through multiple uh, update of the version, so we would get a, a mapping done and then another version would come out, and then we would have to go back and sort of, uh, you know, adapt to the new version. So that was a significant longitudinal challenge for our product, uh, for our project, um, as well as, um, you know, the the old mod because it's an open source, it's a freely available tool. Uh, there, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, funding resources that went towards this, but, you know, each uh, the, uh, the common data models and the source EHR to destination mappings really grew up organically based on whoever needed to use it for whatever project next. So you would have this organic process by which these mappings were installed into the source software. Um, um, and, and so you ended up with quite a few gaps in coverage for some cases. So just to give you a feel for some of the terminologies that OMOP has included in its common data model, um, they've leveraged first the, the uh, National Library of Medicine's uh, UMLS uh, repository, um, which has a lot of cross-linking and a lot of cross-maps. So it includes uh, common terminologies like SNOMED, ICD-9, RxNorm, NDFRT, um, and some of the VA product class information, along with LOINC and some other popular uh, coding strategies. And so I won't go into too much detail, but it's, it's, uh, it's an involved process by which there's a document that's approximately 100 pages long that's in, uh, called an extract, transform, and load document that goes through each one of these tables and then gives you guidance on how you would take your electronic health record and map your electronic health record data into these tables, cross-link it, and then uh, have that process automated where you could basically keep up with your uh, clinical data warehouse in order to be able to participate in these sort of distributed types of analytics. And so there's quite a steep learning curve here. I mean, now we can turn this around very quickly, but you know, it took us, uh, you know, maybe one and a half to two FTEs worth of work for, you know, it was a six months effort uh, was the real steep learning curve, but it was a significant investment. Even on, on, at the level of, uh, of the of single VA, we were using a common data model across our six VAs. So it was actually a significant effort. So any institution that wants to map its uh, data to a common data model really has to consider that um, into, their, into their calculations. So to give you another uh, little bit more granular view of what the common data model looks like, this is an example of, of the ICD-9 coding um, where you would have a certain uh, clinical concept like subarachnoid hemorrhage. It would have an ICD-9 code and it would map to a common OMOP concept. And you might have some of these concepts in other terminologies in other uh, vocabularies and all of them would map all of the subarachnoid hemorrhages would map to this single concept so that no matter which EHR you were from, you would end up being able to say, well, I want all patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, so give me this code and all of its children codes in the OMOP uh, uh, mapping, and you'd be able to do that without knowing anything at all about the source electronic health record. And, um, and so, and so we, uh, we ended up uh, collaborating with both UCSD and the partner systems over a long period of time. Um, in order to execute these, uh, the mappings for this use case. And so I'd like to take a step, a transition point uh, from the data collection, data transformation work that had been, that we've been doing into the analytic engine. And so um, this is the, uh, so this system is the one that was used for all of the results that you will see uh, downstream in the, in the talk. So our design specifications for this when we started out uh, in, the, in the IDASH and scanner projects really was we wanted a, a flexible, uh, a, a, we wanted a flexible framework. So we didn't want to build it in just one programming uh, environment because we wanted to be able to have as many users as possible and it was determined that a combination of C Sharp and Java really would have the widest possible dissemination. We wanted to be able to make it scalable. So, you know, really you might ask, well, why not just use R? Why not just use Stata? Um, 
And the reality is, is that in some of these distributed analytic uh, platforms, you have millions of patients, you have millions and millions of data rows, terabytes of data. And except for SaaS, all of these systems really can't even begin to handle that volume of data. Um, SaaS is a commercial product. In addition, uh, when you start to set it up and using automation, the automation tools in SaaS are a bit more challenging to use. So there, were, there was a clear gap in this area in terms of, of analytic uh, uh, needs for, um, for, for uh, projects going forward. Second, we wanted to be able to make it expandable, make it very modular so that you could just keep adding more and more statistical modules as you uh, needed them. Um, and lastly, we wanted to be able to make an in a front and end interface to it, or actually a back end interface to it, that would allow you to hook it to the I2B2, to OMOP common data model, to flat file. Um, in this project, we did both flat file and OMOP transforms, but, uh, but you could easily um, develop an I2B2 transform or other uh, common data model transform as well. And so this is an overview of some of the analytic methods that are available in the, um, in the toolkit in both .NET and Java. And as you can see, the, the Java version is lagged just a little bit behind. Um, we generally would develop first in .NET and then uh, cross-deploy uh, to, to Java. And, and we got a, uh, some of the medication surveillance work that we were doing for this project sometimes um, made, it, made it where we had to balance uh, deliverable requirements. But you know, the, you know, as you can see here, you know, most of these things are common to any statistical package, descriptive statistics, um, diagnostics for uh, collinear variables and things like that and your typical uh, risk modeling and propensity score matching uh, methods you use for risk adjustment. I think what was less common and really only available in a few sources, particularly at the time of the inception of this DBP, but even true to some extent now, is that these sequential comparative effectiveness analytic techniques really hadn't been deployed as uh, standardized modules in SAS or R. Some custom scripts had been made, but um, but really, um, this hadn't been widely deployed. O OMOP has since, uh, during its deployment, made a set of SAS scripts that you can um, use. But again, these are sort of one-off uh, manual runs, and they don't have all of these methods included. So this was sort of filling a niche need for sequential comparative effectiveness analytics. And so um, statistically, when you, th when you think about doing these sort of analytic methods, you, you in an observational cohort, you're never going to be able to really um, address all of the unmeasured confounding in the population in the same way that you could with a randomized controlled trial. But what you want to try to do is uh, select the methodologies that are going to be the most uh, comprehensive for, for your needs in order to try to address some measured confounding. And you can go about sort of adjusting for the measured confounding in your observation cohort in two ways. So you can either use a retrospective risk adjustment model to adjust for uh, confounding, or you can do what has uh, become much more common in the last few years, where you actually take a cohort and you um, and you basically look at a time slice, you develop a propensity score for that time slice, and then you you basically match between the unexposed and exposed across time in order to do sort of prospective concurrent matching, which also allows you to adjust for some of the unmeasured effects because you're able to restrict uh, your matches by time so that you won't have a patient from 2008 in which you know, different clinical practice was in, uh, in effect from a pa match a patient to 2012, and so that it reduces the, uh, the noise in your analyses. Secondly, you want to choose a comparative effectiveness analytic framework that really addresses the type of question you're asking, but also addresses the limitations in the data that you have. So maybe you want to analyze case to case to case, or maybe you want to analyze, you know, grouping by a week or a month or a quarter. You also need to decide whether or not you uh, need a certain uh, alerting threshold on your signal detection, whether you're looking for an odds ratio of two, whether you're looking for any sign statistically significant difference uh, between the two groups. You also need to be able to incorporate uh, explicitly type 1 and type 2 measurement error. And because you're doing this sequentially, so you take, uh, you take your time period 1, and you take your time period 2 and time period 3, and you're accumulating the data so that when you analyze the data in time period three, you actually are including the data from time period one and two. And by doing that sequentially, you're incur incurring potentially repeated measurement error that you have to also account for. And so one of the methods that we'll be using and the method that Fred will be talking about in the remainder of his presentation is a prospective proportional difference analysis, which takes from the sequential, uh, takes from the statistical process control literature, but uh, the strengths of this method are that it allows you to, pro to do a prospective concurrent analysis, as I mentioned before, where you 
build a propensity score model on the exposure of interest. So if you're interested in uh, dabigatran, then you model the propensity score on that exposure, match between cases uh, that were exposed to that study drug versus the comparator drug, and do that in time periods so that each model is in effect for only that time period. So you match cases quarter one to quarter one, quarter two to quarter two, et cetera. Then you aggregate all of those cases together and do your own analytics. Um, the, the good news about this is that propensity score matching is able to really deal with much more rare data. So if you're doing a uh, risk adjustment model traditional, then you have to have, you can only have one variable in your model for every 10 outcomes. But if you're dealing with propensity score models, um, literature has shown that that's stable, those models are stable down to about four, uh, four uh, one variable per four outcomes instead of one to 10. So it allows you to do uh, more rare outcomes, and uh, which allows you to use more covariates. So to, to orient you to the, uh, what you're going to see as far as the graphing output of oceans for the rest of the presentation, this is a proportional difference graph. So this is a, a, a no difference between the, uh, the exposed uh, group and the unexposed group or the study drug and the comparator drug group would be a 0%. And what you're looking at is if you, you're looking at the confidence interval of the difference between the comparator groups. And if the lower confidence bound exceeds zero, then this, the novel agent or the study drug, the drug of interest, is at higher risk for the outcome than, uh, than you would expect based on the comparison group. And if it's lower, if this upper confidence interval is actually below the 0% line, then it's showing a uh, reduction, a statistically significant reduction in that outcome for the, comparator, for the study drug versus the, the uh, comparator drug. So another method that's built into oceans, but one that we, uh, we won't be going into in the remainder of the presentation is risk-adjusted SPRT. So one of the benefits of this method is that it explicitly incorporates alpha and beta error as well as doing a sequential case-by-case -case analysis rather than by quarter or by time period, which it can potentially allow for a slightly more granular analysis. The limitations of this is that it uses a uh, logistic regression or linear regression retrospective risk model and so you have some of the limitations in terms of the one, uh, one uh, variable in your outcome for 10 outcomes. And, and you also can only use data from the past, so you lose some of the uh, close uh, matching in time between the two groups, which can reduce some of the unmeasured confounding by temporal limiting. So you might build a model from 2009 and apply it to data from 2012, which can have some additional um, potential uh, error and bias in your analysis. So an example of this, and these, uh, these graphing elements are available in oceans and are outputted as part of the statistical package, is that you, it's a cumulative log likelihood ratio. So as you're going along, every case that does not have the outcome of interest gets a negative deflection. Every case that ends up with the outcome of interest gets a positive deflection. This dotted line, based on your odds ratio of interest in your alpha and beta error, shows that you would you have a statistically significant difference in the, in the, the exposed group as compared to the risk adjustment model. And the, if you were to cross this line, you would reject that it was an elevated uh, event rate. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch this back over to Fred to give, a, give the results for the study. Do people need to stand up and stretch? It's OK. <laughs> we won't be. We, maybe we should do some kind of like alertness testing or something now. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I think that, that what Michael sort of has presented is an unbelievable uh, amount of work and contribution to future uh, projects that is available, uh, again, the, uh, through IDASH, the OMOP Common Data Model Tools, the OCEAN's uh, analytic framework and toolkit. Um, it just doesn't exist uh, for any kind of sur medical surveillance purposes outside of IDASH. So I think that that is an incredible uh, contribution. And this is how we applied this stuff. Um, so if we look across, uh, this is just looking at the atrial fibrillation use case. Uh, and this is sort of just giving you a snapshot of what the patients looked like. And I won't go through this in detail, but I was sort of interested in the total contribution um, of the patients and the total number of patients uh, before all um, uh, final exclusions. These were the patients that were available, um, you know, after the initial steps of case identification. So about 5,000 patients uh, were available after initial case identification. About, um, uh, and, and I'm sorry, the, the, the numbers here sort of 
uh, represent all preliminary data, un unfortunately. This is uh, year-old data when it was only 4.4 percent. I think it's up to about 10 percent using the study drug, but the demographics stay about the same. So about 30 percent of all the patients were uh, female, um, but pretty low rates uh, of, of comorbid conditions, which I think simply demonstrates low rates of coding for the comorbid condition. It's very unlikely that we have such a low rate of diabetes. So things that we need to continue to explore. So again, we have these three use cases, and I'm going to split up the results into the three use cases. So new onset atrial fibrillation, we're looking at the new drug, dabigatran, against the old drug, Coumadin. And uh, that's the first thing we'll look at. And this is the, uh, uh, the uh, proportional difference test. Uh, performed quarter by quarter by quarter in a cumulative fashion, and the outcome here is the risk of death. And we would not have expected from the randomized clinical data that there should be a significant difference in death, and that's what we get confirmed here, is that the confidence interval uh, always spans zero, a, a zero difference between the new drug and the old drug. And uh, this is the total number of patients. It's far less than the large sample size, but this is after the one-to-one -one matching of finding every patient in a quarter who looks as much as we can tell just like the other patient who got the other drug in that quarter. So we're trying to create, it's almost like trying to recreate a randomized trial where you get a cohort of patients randomly assigned to get the new drug or the old drug. In some ways we're trying to uh, retroactively create such cohorts. So no difference in death. Uh, no significant difference is in stroke, although perhaps there's a trend towards an improvement. Again, below the line, the new drug has an advantage, so down is good in these, uh, in these graphs. Um, why is there such little data early on? Uh, well, this is this uptake of medication problem. Uh, these are novel drugs, and it takes a while. And you can see, by the way, Partners is starting to get lots of patients that we can match. The VA, very few patients of the most novel agents until much later uh, in our um, observational time period. But again, a trend, uh, but not statistically significant, towards a reduction in cerebrovascular events. But here we go with a green means good, <laughs> so below the line is green, a significant decrease in the risk of thromboembolic events, uh, which is not a surprise, but the uh, randomized control trials did not show this. Um, and so those are all the sort of efficacy measures. Did it do, did the drug do what it was supposed to do? And in fact, it was tending to do what it was supposed to do, which is reduce the risk of bad things happening in patients who got atrial fibrillation. So, uh, so Jim, why do you think the RCTs didn't show that? Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure that this is more noise. Uh, I'm sorry, wait a second, go back. Uh, I don't know that, I, 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 I can't explain yet why, uh, we would find something that RCTs wouldn't. Um, this doesn't include stroke risk. So what we need to do here, by the way, uh, for our final analysis is combine thromboembolic event and stroke, which was how it was reported in the RCT. The two were combined. But it may be that we are saying the same thing because the RCTs showed a decline in the combined output in the combined outcome. Um, all right, so major bleeding. Uh, now, the bleeding risk was actually a little bit higher in the randomized trial, but uh, we're finding something different. There's a trend, and it's actually statistically significant at this point in time, um, but it's sort of hovering on the edge of significance, so not sure, um, for major bleeding, very low event rates. Uh, likewise, even minor bleeding was hovering on the edge of statistical significance. It was significant, but then with more accumulating da data, it was less significant. But possibly, if we were to continue the study, it may, uh, our confidence intervals get, may get narrower, if the, and if the point estimates stayed about the same, it would be significant. So uh, interestingly, the bleeding risk appears lower in this population than we would have expected. Uh, but um, I don't know if I had mentioned it earlier, there had been, and there almost always is, some pendulum-like effect when med new medications are released. The pendulum effect is often uh, relatively exuberant uptake in patients who may not have been studied, uh, adverse events being reported back to the FDA, cries of alarm because of these uh, spontaneous and, and sort of uh, voluntary anecdotal reports. Uh, and it's unclear whether there really is a problem or there isn't, but then it affects who is prescribed that medication in the next sort of quarter. 
And so to, we haven't really controlled for what types of patients were in each quarter, but it may be that what we're seeing is uh, the medication being used in patient populations that sort of differ over time, and we'll have to look at that. Um, now, the same medication was used for a different indication. This is thromboembolic disease, and that's a blood clot in the leg called a DVT, or a blood clot that basically travels from the leg to the lung. That's called a pulmonary embolism, so deep venous thrombosis, or pulmonary embolism. Um, and uh, this was a, a s studied in a different randomized trial, and in this trial, dabigatran really performed in the same way as Coumadin. There wasn't an advantage, but there wasn't a disadvantage. Again, dabigatran does have the principal advantage that it, it doesn't require the monitoring. It's not as variable in its effect. So in this case, you know, uh, it certainly isn't looking as good, although it's sort of interesting that as data is accumulating, there's sort of a, an indication that we're getting more and more similar between the drugs. Maybe earlier on, in fact, they have this one outlier that's a problem. The drug is worse, the bigotrend is worse than Coumadin, but it quickly sort of normalizes and over time, uh, maybe would have been a little concerned here, but then over time it quickly normalizes to where it's pretty equivalent. Um, this now is cerebrovascular event um, where we, you know, it stays, it stays somewhat favorable but not statistically significant. Um, recurrent th thromboembolic events were just very low, so huge confidence intervals around, plus the population of matched patients ends up being quite small. So the sample size just reduces down to something where we're not going to see uh, significance. Um, bleeding was higher early on, uh, and this is, again, around the same time that the sort of mortality rate was higher, uh, and I wonder whether this indicates that this medication in this condition was being used in higher-risk patients, and that maybe over time, after those alarm bells were going off about the use of this drug and perhaps increased bleeding, it started to be used in these centers at, in patients who were maybe a little bit less uh, at risk, and so then the difference between the two drugs looks diff you know, less apparent. Um, Minor bleeds, again, higher earlier on, then normalizes or uh, less significant thereafter. It's not that surprising that there's so somewhat differences between the same two medication comparison, that is, both of those use cases, atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolic disease, were both looking at dabigatran as the new drug against Coumadin as the old drug, but they sort of found different things. So in the AF population, um, there was a uh, lower uh, risk of bleeding uh, in the population treated, um, but they're very different patient cohorts where the uh, patient pop the, the absolute risk of bleeding may in fact be higher on the atrial fibrillation side, but those are much older patients, and so the difference between the two drugs may be quite different because Coumadin just has such a narrow therapeutic window. So we'll look in further into what it means that these two are different, but even the randomized trials showed them to be substantially different in their outcome comparisons. So then we look at a completely different drug, uh, prosegrel versus the existing drug, clopidogrel, and we're looking at a, a specific cohort where this is used, acute coronary syndromes, which is either unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI, where drug-eluting stents are used. And why did we have to get so specific here? Because um, the guidelines, clinical guidelines, have differing lengths of treatment time for different types of conditions. So if you just said uh, just anyone who got Prosegrel, that would be a whole sort of mixed bag of patients who are supposed to be on it for a week, a month, six months, a year for life uh, of very varying degrees of risk for recurrent events. So we tried to come up with some population that had a re sort of a similar risk. And uh, what we're going to show here is that Prosegrel is, looks uh, quite similar in the risk of death over time uh, with the uh, risk from clopidogrel, so again, really right on sort of identity here, which is zero difference in the proportional difference study. Um, likewise, cerebrovascular event, very similar between the two. Uh, major bleeding is uh, very similar between the two. Uh, interestingly, the clinical trial, just to remind myself, <laughs> is that it showed higher risks of, higher risk of bleeding in the large randomized trial. Even all subsequent or the major subsequent trials have also shown higher risk for Prosegrel, so in a reassuring way, we're not seeing evidence for a significantly increased risk of bleeding with this novel agent in the patients who were prescribed this agent as best as we can compare to similar patients treated with clopidogrel. Similarly, no increased risk of minor bleeding with Prosegrel in the patients who received it. So, uh, you know, we, I think we're able to accomplish uh, 
sort of a lot, especially in the last week, of uh, being able to run these analyses on these multiple centers uh, data sets. But clearly there are some significant challenges um, and limitations to the interpretation of, uh, of the data, but I still think there's actually some interesting uh, clinical insights we can take away, which is really part of the mission of the DBP process, is to try to take these tools and informatics infrastructure um, and innovation and then push towards some biologic um, conclusions. So we have, I think, four major limitations or challenges that we face. The first is, uh, and, and we've highlighted these along the way, really disparate uh, source data and representation of that data within these very different types of institutions. Number two, we had you know, variable regulatory policies from the IRBs, and there's been a lot of discussion about the challenge of uh, doing health outcomes or secondary use of data type research. But it, at a practical level, this really made it very hard for us to synchronize even the time windows of studying, when data became available, when we could aggregate the data in a meaningful way. The third, Michael alluded to, is just the challenging uh, learning curve associated with the use of OMOP and how resource intensive that really can be. And uh, the fourth is more of a clinical interpretation that there is a uh, significant challenge when studying post-market release of drugs or devices that there has to be enough patients that one can study over time and it really depends on how those participating centers adopt the use of those uh, new medications. So we've talked about this a little bit, just the highlights in the interest of time. The patient populations are really different across these institutions. More than 70, 75% of patients at the VA get all of their care at the VA, and it's really less than 50% at the AMCs, the, Amer uh, the academic medical centers. VA is uh, predominantly male, um, but the male patients, that is. Um, the non-governmental AMCs really, uh, in these conditions, about 30% to 35% women. The VA has a sicker patient population with more medical comorbidities and therefore more frequent MD visits and therefore more coded conditions per patient, um, as well as the VA having access to drug dispensing information, which we do not have at the other uh, organizations. And then within the representation, that also varies. So diagnosis codes are available. Um, I think were available at the uh, UCSD, but billing codes weren't. Problem lists uh, were used uh, as the preferential source of better data at some institution versus others. Um, and then another sort of uh, sort of systemic or systematic bias is that because the VA doesn't run on the same financial motivation as the private hospitals run, where each additional condition that's coded for the private institutions leads to a higher case mix index and therefore higher reimbursement, there's a potential for uh, systematic undercoding uh, in the VA. And that's been shown by other investigators. So the IRB governance we talked about, UCSD had the challenge of not being able to request prospective data sets, so they had to keep going back to the IRB with any to try to extend the study every, you know, every time there was uh, the follow-on that we needed. There was uh, limits as to the number of, admission, of, of amendments that could be uh, submitted uh, based on local IRB rules, uh, limits on the frequency of the data requests, if not on the number of amendments. Um, the participating, participating sites also had restrictions on the scope, breadth, and volume of data available. Partners, um, we had a maximum number of records, which uh, was uh, 10,000, but we had cohorts that were uh, 18,000, so we had to like splice data together, which was very uh, time intensive. And for a long time, the UCSD administrative billing and coding data was not available. It was really managed by a different part of the organization. Uh, OMOP, big challenge, uh, but again, enormous amount of progress, and therefore the uh, you know uh, next generation studies that might be interested in using it, um, I think, can benefit from this early adopter phase. As Michael pointed out, lots of time to get the initial launch of OMOP. Um, OMOP continues to evolve, um, and we did not uh, apply all of the complexity of the data uh, schema of OMOP uh, for this particular study. Uh, there was missing uh, source codes uh, that challenged our use of OMOP, um, and <clears throat> There was limited sample size. We talked about the low number of exposures. Uh, why is it that we have um, limited exposures? Well, 
maybe it's actually a good thing uh, that we have limited exposures to new devices, or new medications rather. Part of the thing that drives it is that these medications are 10 to 20 times more expensive per dose uh, than the existing medications, and that leads to all sorts of uh, decisions made uh, by the healthcare institutions and providers, so there's uh, may be significant delay, especially at large coordinated care uh, organizations like the VA. Um, but even the just what patients are insured to cover what medications is uh, may impact the adoption and um, the types of patients that receive the medication, and therefore those that we study. Um, so, in conclusion, we have some clinical conclusions. So. Uh, we can say that in this data set, patients with new onset atrial fibrillation, we found that dabigatran was associated with reduced rates of thromboembolic events and trends toward reduction of major and minor bleeding. Um, and you know that's unique, and I think it assures us if our initial concern was that, again, we're monitoring the safety, that there would be higher rates of adverse events, we do not see any evidence for that. We see evidence for the opposite in those patients treated with dabigatran with atrial fibrillation. In patients with venous thromboembolic disease, um, there were no significant differences between the uh, two drugs, that's dabigatran and Coumadin, uh, but there was a early evidence of increased bleeding risk that abated over time, and we wonder whether in that population it may have something to do with uh, different patients being selected at terms of different levels of risk over time. In patients with acute coronary syndromes who got drug-eluting stents, the two drugs were really exchangeable in terms of the event rates observed after all adjustments. Um, and then from sort of an informatics perspective, certainly we believe that distributed surveillance is necessary in order to monitor infrequently used medications with low event rates. And uh, my time is up, but we have these only two bullet points, so I'll go over them real quick. <laughs> um, if you think about it, um, while our sample size is low, we actually were pulling together organizations that had on the order of four million outpatient visits amongst them a year. And so uh, with the reason that we ended up sort of uh, funneling down into such low uh, comparator group and, and the two groups that we were studying, that is the one that got new medication versus the old medication, is that we were trying to adjust for all these differences in time and, and medical comorbidities. And we're not really sure how you would do that without a distributed system unless you had some kind of universal uh, electronic health record system. So I think a distributed analysis is necessary to answer or at least address these types of questions. Uh, we learned certainly that transformation to a common data model is really required um, to have an effect effective distributed analysis across the institutions. And we believe that it's uh, feasible uh, and the technical components, the technical components such as oceans can be shared amongst these disparate healthcare organizations to be able to sort of synchronize the analysis and perform these distributed prospective safety surveillance and surveillance analyses. So with that, thank you uh, very much to the team, to your patients for uh, listening <laughs> to a long presentation today. And uh, Michael and I are happy to answer uh, any questions. So thank you very much. Yeah, wake up. So uh, th that was a great presentation. My question is, why doesn't the FDA just make it a law that everybody has to do this now? Well, uh, there's a lot of interest in the FDA. I work much more so with the Center for uh, Devices and Radiologic Health on the device safety surveillance side. And this notion of active surveillance is certainly uh, a major focus for them. Um, on the medication side, um, I think their push has been to Sentinel, which has been, uh, in some ways it's similar, it's a distributed analysis, but it's using really administrative claims data. And so one has to um, sort, of, sort of weigh the difference between very large data sets that are available in administrative claims data um, that are sort of, uh, you know, they're much more sort of limited in terms of, we talked about the uh, columns versus rows. So they have lots and lots of rows, thousands, millions of patients, 100 million patients in those data sets, but very few columns, uh, very little limited information that describes the individuality of the patient. Um, and uh, that's where they, uh, um, CEDAR, the Center for uh, Drug Research, has focused its effort is really on Sentinel. On the other hand, I think there's a tremendous interest sort of organically from investigators 
to look especially uh, in sort of a perspective fashion as we have, and I think some of the progress that's been made on the infrastructure and tool development side will make sort of answering the next question much easier. So hopefully when we write this up, there will be uh, other centers interested in participating. And maybe the FDA would become interested too, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, d doesn't that seem like that's what their job is once they've licensed a drug is to do this kind of, I mean, I want them to be looking at all the drugs that I give my patients or I'm taking and do this kind of research. I mean, the drug companies aren't going to pay for it, right? Because they don't want to know. Seems that way. Seems right, that way. Right. In fact, all three of those uh, or four of those examples of the different medications for which there was a major controversy in, the, uh, in between 2004 and 2010 were all cases where the, act, the drug company, in fact, had data internally showing these complications by sort of doing meta-analysis of the many, many randomized trials that were done. But uh, for a lot of reasons, those, that data, I mean, we can think of the reasons, but for a lot of business preservation reasons, those data are uh, not released publicly. And so it really, unfortunately, you need a watchdog on the outside. You can't really rely upon um, the industry itself to effectively police itself for this. Things I would add is, you know, the, the Sentinel Initiative actually did release an analysis of the Dibigatran uh, versus Warfarin using their uh, claims data, but it received uh, quite a bit of criticism from the Pharmacoepi uh, group for not sort of having, there was no filtering, there, they just did a sort of a relatively unadjusted analysis comparing the outcomes, and, and so, you know, there's concern that if you don't really try to get comparable groups, you aren't really going to get a, a good answer. Um, so that's one comment. The other comment I would make is that the FDA, part of what Fred said, the FDA uh, roadmap for its medical device surveillance specifically includes electronic health record surveillance at this level of depth as part of its goal over the next three to five years for its roadmap. So they're, they're aware, although I think different groups sort of have different uh, foci, as you mentioned. So, yeah, so, I mean, from, from my mind, I think that the adoption of a common data model and, and if there could be a sufficient um, sort of coalescence around, you know, OMOP, if it's the best that we have today, or uh, some other well-organized, well-structured common data model would be essential. And I would love to see um, the incentive for that perhaps be a meaningful use uh, requirement at a stage four or something that that every electronic health record system of X number of patients or larger be compatible with OMOP that would just permit them to share those data owners to share to the extent that uh, sharing policies will permit uh, to, to, sh to allow them to share because it's, the, it's really that local mapping into OMOP that uh, requires um, such local expertise and knowledge about the data set. But once you have that, then these tools that Michael's group, under Michael's leadership, were able to build and others who could contribute in an open source environment to such tools become applicable to sort of the entire community of those organizations willing to share their data. I think OMOP common data model is key. So I, I would also add, you know, the CTSAs have really adopted the I2B2 model as sort of their underlying uh, common data model. So I, what I see now is sort of the two groups starting to talk to each other and there's interest in a, basically an interoperability layer between OMOP and I2B2. So I think that's something that needs to happen. Once that happens, then you'll have institutions, because you, you aren't going to have an institution that's going to spend all the money to do both. They're going to do one and then there's going to be an effort sp uh, spring up to really have interconnected uh, inter uh, interoperability layers so that then you can have truly large scale uh, analytics. So I, I think that's one of the other areas to focus on. I think so. Um, I think so. I think that uh, a lot of the <laughs> thoughtful planning um, and meticulousness really arose from trying to make un 
sure that we were we were sort of um, you know comparing the apples at one center to the apples at the next to the apples at the third, but I, I believe that the methods are actually a little bit more robust than th that doesn't actually require that because the uh, matching was occurring at the local levels, and so it's probably not as essential to have gone through the sort of, you know, repetitive sequential sort of, you know, exactly what diabetes was mapped to in this center versus the other, as long as within a center there was some understanding of how those uh, sort of parameters were identified. I, I think you could be much more nimble. I think the part of, we had a lot of time to be methodical because we had to learn OMOP and we had to build the tools from ground up. Anyway, I know we're, in the interest of time, uh, whoop, is there one last question from the musician in the right side? Question is you had um, like we we were looking at uh, rates of adverse events across a couple of drugs, but I imagine that there was some having seen some a lot of these EMRs like uh, there's probably some. I mean, I imagine death was reliable, like reliably made it into the EMR, but probably a lot of patients were put on a drug and taken off the drug, and, and there was not necessarily like. So, so I guess, like, what kind of sanity checking did you have against sort of what you expected to see? Uh, so say you had a drug and you knew from the, stu from, from the trials that were initial from, like, phase one or whatever, a certain percentage of patients had bleeding. What yeah. percentage of patients did you encounter that had the given adverse event compared to what you expected to see? And how did that sort of, like, loss of what got in the EMR compare to the magnitude of the differences? Those are great questions. Um, my understanding is that the event rates were all a little bit lower than what we had anticipated, which is sort of the reverse from what you would expect. You would expect that in an observational cohort, the event rate should actually be higher than that seen in a randomized trial. But there is a significant um, sort of ascertainment bias in what we were looking at, less so probably within the VA system, more so at the two academic centers where uh, death being the exception where I think both centers used a death index and sort of updated their uh, own EHR, but other major events may not get, not get coded if the patient got care, happened to get care at another, uh, under another system, even locally. Um, so the undercounting of events, and we were just uh, banking on uh, sort of uh, a lack of bias in that under in that event ascertainment problem. But I think those sorts of sanity checks are important. And we were actually not showing absolute rates. We were showing um, proportional differences between the event rates um, uh, with the hope, and maybe it's an assumption we should put that in, that the ascertainment differences should not be um, sort of distributed in an unbalanced way. But we don't know that yet. But we can look at the two populations. I think it's good advice. It's like conceivably there could be if Absolutely. there was a bias towards like uh standard of care versus the, you, the, right. the extent to which people would report on standard of care versus the novel therapy. Which well, and so we weren't looking for reporting. Uh, we, were, we were looking for... I mean, the, not reporting, but yeah. I mean, uh, even making... But you're right. So if someone with nose bleeding, it may be much more likely that they would come back looking for help because they were on dibigatran as opposed to warfarin because they knew that warfarin was always going to cause them nose bleeding, so those people never came back. So I think those kind of inherent biases and biases against new meds are important. Anyway, I see I'm, I'm getting the, the hook. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>